the next few weeks were a mixture of work and frantic reading about the paranormal. I knew after that experience that my knowledge base on the subject was minute and needed a major overhaul, but still, by the time Burroughs next contacted me, I didn't really feel that much the wiser. It was the formal tone of his scant message that got me. Next meeting is on the 8th of October, at 11 p.m. precisely. Coordinates are below. No how are you, or a lead in, or even a dress code. But I still had the robe he'd given me, and I assumed I'd be needing it again. Five days later, I was at those coordinates. A place with the odd name of Nymphsfield, just by a large wind turbine in Gloucestershire. The odd thing was that only Burroughs was waiting there in his SUV that night. He greeted me with a flash of his lights as I pulled up, and then he hurried over and opened my door to tell me that the others had parked elsewhere, and that they would be waiting for us by a lake about a mile away. What followed was a small endurance test, as we made our way under the light of the full moon. Burroughs was carrying his obligatory lantern, but it was not lit. Not drawing attention to ourselves was, I thought, probably for the best. We would have made an odd sight that night. Two figures bedacked in hooded robes, as we vaulted over gates and fences, and trudged through knotted grasses, swampy ground, and then through thick, overgrown woods, until at length we came to a lake, where the light of a single lantern illuminating two wooden rowing boats told me that our companions were near, Burroughs at that moment lit his lantern, and we were greeted by a hushed chant from those figures among the trees that awaited us. We are thirteen. We are forever thirteen, they said as we approached. Burroughs simply replied, I am the Dominus Noctis. The twelve are mine this night. We were then soon all aboard the boats, gliding almost silently across the ebony surface of that lake as we floated through thick plates of lilies. The silvery light of that radiant orb above us, shimmering around us, then, in but a short time, land greeted us again, and we disembarked and weaved our way through dense forest, until we glimpsed what I knew must be our destination, a great house illuminated only by the light of the moon. It looked to all the world as if it were a great wall of almost cathedral-like windows, great arched roofs above them, almost like some grand seminary where priests might learn their art. I stopped in my tracks for a second, and as I took that scene in, I was sure I saw a glowing face in one of the upper windows. Burroughs stepped up behind me, they're waiting for us tonight, he whispered. Soon we were at a door, not the main entrance, but by the look of it, what might have at one time been the entrance to the kitchens. But as we went inside, what greeted us was not the grand scene I'd expected, 
and that what appeared to be almost a work in progress. It was clearly old, but at some time I imagined it must have been abandoned or never finished. Either way, it did make me wonder how it had ever come to be haunted. Burrows led our progress through the house, and I was at the back, acutely aware that I was a little too far from a lantern for comfort. As we moved from room to finely carved corridor, to stairs that led down. I seemed to constantly be stumbling on uneven surfaces beneath me, hampered by the near total darkness that felt as if it concealed a thousand eyes, watching and waiting. As everyone else made their way downward, my robe seemed to catch on a metal gateway, which was only half open at the top of the stairs. I turned a little to try to feel where it might be snagged, and it was then I noticed a figure, barely visible in the pale moonlight, shining in through a window at the end of the long corridor. The others were by now at the bottom of the steps, and what little light I had was all but about to disappear. I called out in something of a panic, that I was stark, while at the same time being mesmerized in rising dread as this dark shadow seemed to be drifting through the air toward me. I shouted for Burrows. Any curiosity I had had now been utterly overridden by a crushing sense of terror, almost as if death itself approached. I moved to rip myself free and then it was as if someone had been holding me fast and they suddenly released their grip. I went surging forward, down the steps almost skittering across their surface, before crashing down at the bottom. Burrows came running out. Oh my God, what happened? he said. Are you okay? He was clearly concerned as I frantically rubbed my bruised leg. Something grabbed me. I replied, tried to stop me coming down. Burrows visibly grimaced, and asked me if there was anything broken. I don't think so, I told him as I struggled to my feet. We'd better hurry, he then said, as he seemed agitated and ill at ease. We walked down a short passage, and into a vaulted chamber where everyone else was waiting stood within a large circle of candles, candles that we had not brought with us. The atmosphere was thick and heavy, choking and claustrophobic to the senses, and for a split second I wanted to turn and to run from the place. But again, this was exactly what I was here for, this buzz of terror and I knew beyond it lay that knowledge, the knowledge I craved. Burrows and I took our places to form a complete circle. Everyone then joined hands. It was at that point I noticed a brass dish at the centre of our group, in which there appeared to be burning coals that I assumed Burroughs had just ignited. At the side of that, another bowl, seemingly filled with some herbal mixture. I could only assume that this was some incense that had some special purpose. The oppression in the air made me fleetingly hope that it might be for some cleansing ritual, but that particular wish turned out to be folly. We stood for many minutes in silence, heads bowed. I assumed the purpose was too tuned to the property, and I tried as best I could to mimic their act. Burroughs eventually raised his hand, and began a mumbled ritual of summoning, in a tongue that I couldn't recognize at all. I guessed it was Middle Eastern, 
but like nothing remotely known to me. As he spoke, it was almost as if the world beyond our circle of candles was progressively being starved of light. He finished his incantation and a chant, then slowly rose from my companions. Kabu Mitu, they said, and I had no idea at the time what this meant. I fully expected Tilia to repeat her previous seeming state of possession, and so my eyes were fixed upon her. Burroughs then stepped forward, and reaching down he took hold of the dish containing the incense, tipping the entire heat mixture onto the glowing coals. The room instantly filled with clouds of smoke, acrid, sweet, and choking all at the same time. As Burroughs retook his place, the chant now reached fever pitch, the sound of it almost pounding in my head. The vaporous haze rising before me almost seemed to obscure the faces of those around me. Their dark robes of blurred almost melted into the background, and then I felt as if I were floating, floating away from them all, floating and then falling backwards, my hands releasing from those either side of me, my companions seeming to dissolve into darkness. My head hit the cold stone slabs, yet it didn't hurt. I knew it should have, but it didn't. I raised myself a little to try to see, to see the others, but the room was empty, save for a twisted strand of darkened smoke rising from that incense burner, like a dancing, sinuous human figure. I stared, mesmerized, as two eyes appeared in that writhing miasma, eyes that were fixed upon me. I knew, somewhere deep, buried in my mind what Burroughs had done. I tried to rise, tried to control my limbs, but I was no longer the master of my form. Burroughs had stripped away my powers of sentient control by opiates and noxious herbs. He had cleared away the delusion of corporal reality that the human mind clings to. I was in the other worlds, and I was at their mercy. That dread figure then took clearer form before me, a man of smoke and shadow, a man of pure dread. Screams suddenly filled the air around me. I did not know if they were my companions, or those of some long-dead denizens of this awful place. I tried to raise my hand in some feeble attempt to protect myself, but it merely quivered at my side as this thing drew a thin, spindly arm high above me. What I can only describe as a large fish hook lay in its hand, a hook it brought down into my mouth and through my cheek with one swift, backed movement as it leant forward and rattled into my ear. You shouldn't be here, little fish. I cried out in agony, my screams melding with the others around me. For all the world I was sure I could hear Burroughs crying out for help, his voice in a cacophony of suffering. But then I was being dragged out into the corridor, and then up the cold hard steps. All I could see of my abuser was a shadow hanging over me. My head thumped against the cold hard stone hitting my skin as I was drawn helplessly upwards. 
and the screaming had by now given way to a chorus of muddled voices interspersed with mournful wailing. As I was drawn up and out into the passage, I could see figures and shapes around me. You shouldn't be here, someone whispered in my ear. This is our place. An ear-splitting scream deafened me as I slid away, pulled by that jagged barb to what I now imagined must be some terrible fate, a twisted route, then out into the cold night air, across a gravel path, the light of the moon giving no solace to my mind, now utterly crippled by fear. Then, onto the dew-covered grass I was taken, I could see another shadow moving towards me, it was a horse, a great black horse, with a plume on its head and eyes, like burning coal. It came close and reared up before me, its hooves threatening to dash the life from me. Then that voice came again. Goodbye, little fish. Do not... Come again. It rasped, as it felt for all the world, like that great equine spirit kicked me away, as I rolled over and over until I came to rest in an ornamental pond, where I then lay floating on my back in that cold water, watching the stars and clouds above me swirling in some kaleidoscopic insane dance. I have no real idea exactly how long I lay there. I would guess a good half hour. We need to get out of here, were the words that brought me back to the semblance of reality. It was Burroughs. His hand had grabbed my robes, and he was drawing me out of the water. For a moment I couldn't speak, my mouth felt numb. I could still feel that spike in my cheek. What the hell did you do? I eventually asked. My voice should have contained the rage and anger that was slowly building towards Burroughs, but I couldn't put the emotion into it that I so wanted to. I looked up at his face, faintly glowing in the moonlight reflected on the surface of the water. He winced and half smiled. I broadened our horizons, he said gleefully. I'm glad you find it funny, I responded. I would have appreciated a warning. Burroughs smirked again. What did you see? he asked. I told him about the vaporous figure, of what it had said, and of the horse that kicked me into the lake. And he seemed to find this all equally amusing, almost as if he knew exactly what I was going to say, which again did nothing to impress me. He told me at that point that all he saw of the proceedings before the ungents overwhelmed him was my fall backwards, and then I appeared to push myself away and out of the cellar. So it was all just a drug-induced illusion, I stated angrily. Burroughs shook his head. Not exactly, he replied. The spectral horse and the ghost with the hooked hand are both known to frequent this place, and you did not know that. I became aware at that point just how cold I was, and I began to shiver as I pondered what Burroughs had pointed out. I was fuming at what I saw as his abuse of trust, but at the same time, if what he had said was true, I knew that I had seen something that no other method could have revealed to me so vividly. Yet still, 
my anger did not diminish, and as we began our journey back, in the flickering light of two lanterns led us to the others, who were now huddled together awaiting our arrival. I wondered what horrors they had experienced on Burroughs' herb-induced mystery tour. But I was not to find out, not that night at least, for again we went back in silence, back across the lake, and then we parted ways, as Burroughs and I made our way through the woods and overgrown fields, my mind had time to temper its mood, I began to see the purpose of what Burroughs had done. It was insanely dangerous, I could see that, but at the same time I knew that knowledge is not gained in comfort. Eventually I broke the silence with the words, I suppose that is why I am here. The words weren't exactly targeted at Burroughs, they sort of slipped out of my mouth. Yet he stopped momentarily and turned to me. It's exactly why you're here, he said. You chose the path the night you drove down that lonely road to embrace the unknown, a path many have walked before you, a path that leads to madness and maybe even oblivion. There is no wisdom, true wisdom, without risk. So tell me, he asked, was it not worth that risk to see? I nodded. Yes, I replied in case in that half-light he could not see my confirmation. I want to see more, to see further. I followed. Burroughs laughed ever so slightly. Well, you shall, he said, as he climbed over the wooden gate that led back to where our cars were parked. You shall see more than you ever imagined. He slapped my back, shook my hand, and then with a farewell he hurried to his car and was gone. I took a while longer to leave that place that night. I was still soaked to the skin, and I decided it would be best to remove as much clothing as I could before driving home with the heater on full. But in the end, I cut that plan short, as I became increasingly uneasy. It was almost as if the effects of the incense hadn't worn off completely. I became aware of movements in my peripheral vision, of whispers, and despite my curiosity, I also felt my courage ebb away, almost as if fear were being projected at my very being. I quickly drove away, checking my mirrors constantly for some ghostly horror floating down the road behind me, and there wasn't fortunately, but I was acutely aware that it felt like someone was behind me, in the back seat, a sensation that infused my mind for the entire two-hour journey home. As the weeks then passed, I struggled to totally dispense with the residual anger I'd felt that night towards Burroughs. I wondered if such a foolish act could have got us all killed, and I repeatedly pondered the sense in allowing his rash nature to play games with my sanity. But always it came back to the same question that he had so accurately plucked from my mind. Was it worth the risk? And the answer was always a reluctant yes. As the night of the next full moon approached, I found myself in an ever-increasing state of agitation. I couldn't tell whether it was suppressed excitement or repressed fear. By the time Burroughs finally mailed over the coordinates for our next meeting, I was no longer sleeping at all well, a few hours each night. 
what sleep I did have always seemed to contain dreams based on what had occurred on our previous outings, nightmares in truth, or as I preferred to call them at the time, the idle musings of my subconscious mind. I kept that appointment. I had no real intention of not doing. 11 p.m. and I lay by just south of a minuscule village by the name of Venton, just north-east of Dartmoor in England. Burroughs' black SUV was waiting there when I arrived. I parked behind him, and as he didn't come out to greet me, I quickly went over and knocked on his side window. But Burroughs was leaning over his steering wheel, clearly in some worse-for-wear state. I opened his door. Are you okay, Charles? I asked as I leant forward. He gave me a slow, drawn-out reply. Migraine, he said. It started half an hour ago. I thought it would pass, but then I began throwing up. I asked if there was anything I could do. He told me that there wasn't, and that he would have to sit it out, and that I should go alone and meet the others. A daunting prospect. He explained in briefest detail what I was to do, and he gave me a bag of mugwort incense and a sheet of carefully written instructions that I was to follow when we reached our destination. He then said that he had taken some pills, and in the unlikely event that they reduced his pain sufficiently, that he would follow along when he was able to. I was profoundly disappointed at first. Burroughs, after all, was the linchpin in the proceedings. He told me that I would have to take on his role, that I would have to be the Dominus Noctis this night. The others, he said, though talented, were not inclined to be in control. But in his opinion, I was well suited to the role, and that this would be my chance to get to know them all better. Something I must admit I really had wanted to do, as apart from Tilly, I hadn't had any communication with anyone except Burroughs thus far, and I still felt very much like the outsider. So as I donned my robes and set off on the path Burroughs indicated, I was, in truth, slightly pleased at his misfortune. I climbed into a darkened, high-grown meadow. The moon this night was for the most part hidden behind clouds, but I had the lantern lit that Burroughs should have been carrying to guide my steps. A good fifteen minutes of tangled walking through waist-high grass then brought me to a wall of trees. I followed them to the right, as he had instructed, and in a short time I came to a gap and a barely discernible path that led into that wooded mass. This place was like nowhere I'd ever been before, as I gazed into the thick wood, something deep within me was shouting out at me to turn back, some deep buried intuition that I had been conditioned to ignore long since. The trees were almost animated. When the moon fleetingly appeared from behind her canopy, her light revealed a nebulous mass of finger-like branches weaving through the air. It felt almost like they were reaching and writhing in an attempt to take hold of me, to draw me into them. But logic, foolish logic, prevailed. I wasn't about to let fear put me off. After all, I was the Dominus Noctis this night. I had obligations. I was here to embrace fear, not run from it. And so I strode into that web of wooded flesh. 
and as an owl screeched overhead and as brambles tore at my robe, I made my way eventually to the edge of a shimmering lake that the moon revealed to me in a cascade of soft light dancing on its surface. I looked to my right. The others were supposed to be waiting here, but I could see no lantern. Then, as a gust of wind rippled through the woods, my eyes fell on them, almost statue-like, almost like great dark upright slabs of stone waiting at the water's edge. As I approached, a lantern sparked to life, and I could see the familiar face of Talia illuminated in its light. Charles can't make it, I said as I drew close. He has a migraine. Are you the Dominus Noctis? Talia asked. My brow furrowed in slight bemusement at why she would assume that I was. Yes, I am, I replied, for tonight at least. In unison, everyone else then chanted, Welcome, Dominus Noctis, now and forever master of the night. We are thirteen. We are forever thirteen. I smiled at this grandiose greeting, and I wondered why Burroughs had not been so honored in our previous encounters. But then I mused that maybe he had, and somehow I'd missed this little ritualized ego trip. Two large wooden rowing boats awaited our arrival, I steadied each in turn as all climbed aboard, and as I did it occurred to me at that moment that I only knew Talia's title, and in the event of some calamity like someone falling overboard, that I could really do with knowing what to call them all. Accordingly, I instructed everyone to give me their name as they passed. In the light of my lantern, I then greeted each in turn, almost as if this was our first meeting, and everyone seemed to make a point of fixing my gaze in the soft, warm light of that oil lamp, as if they were making a mental note of my features, an act that I found myself unconsciously reciprocating, as from that moment on, each of them seemed somehow to be fixed in my mind, name to face. The two twins were the first. Victoria and Ella were their names, thin and almost elfin in appearance, their hesitant voices delicate and ephemeral. Then came the overweight man, with the waxed moustache. Mason Brooks, a pleasure to make your acquaintance, he said in a clear and confident tone. The two elderly women were next, Arabella and Edith, a smell of rose water and lilac about them. The three women, who were clearly close friends, were called Delphine, Amanda, and Frances, the man blessed with good looks was called Peter. The woman I imagined a pent-up retired school teacher happened to be called Chastity Collins, and the tall man was called Aled. But as the last person boarded the boat, it occurred to me that they actually were twelve in number and I wondered why they had always said we are thirteen, when we must have been fourteen previously, had they discounted me in our previous encounters. It did feel a little like I wasn't there before, as far as my companions were concerned at least. I boarded a boat, Aled, and Peter took to the oars, as we drifted across those dark waters. Our craft, surrounded by a thin mist, 
I couldn't help feeling as if we had already passed beyond the veil, and I had a primal sense that this night would surpass all that had gone before. The moon had illuminated our journey to the centre of that lake, but as its light was then consumed by a large passing cloud, it was then that I became aware of lights on the far bank, flickering candles or oil lamps placed in a straight double row that led away from the water's edge. A few more strokes of the oars, and I could see what it was that they led to. A large house, not a stately home or a castle, but a grand enough residence. Thirteen large windows were visible, each seemingly containing a number of candles that almost seemed to offer sanctuary from the oddly threatening scene through which we moved. Our boats were in a short time at the shore, and we were out walking up the gravel path that I could now see was flanked by crude oil lamps. Soon we were at the door to that impressive property, oak and imposing. Far larger than a normal entryway, it seemed to tower above us. As I approached, I searched for some bell or knocker to announce our arrival, but the door opened almost immediately. A butler, in his full traditional attire, was stood there, and he waved us in with the words, You are expected. An ever so condescending look on his face, as his hand directed us down a long candlelit hallway to a large, half-open white door. Burroughs, in his scant description, had told me that this house had only recently been constructed, and that the owner found out that not only had they built their house near a once revered ancient lake, but that the area was littered with burial sites and sacred ancient structures, one of which, they believed, must have been disturbed when they built the house, and it had allegedly led to all manner of supernatural activity. Our purpose in being there, Burroughs had explained, was to try to communicate with these beings, not to rid the house of any presence. He had also informed me that the owners would be present, along with some rather important guests, and that whatever I did I should not dwell on who was there, and if I happened to recognize anyone it was best to say and do nothing. Accordingly, as I walked down the hallway, it did not allow my attention to linger on a room to my left where an open door revealed a gathering of around ten people who were murmuring, clearly discussing our arrival. Our destination was a large library. An octagonal walnut table lay at the center of the room, surrounded by red velvet-covered chairs. The room had four large Georgian sash windows, two opposite the door, two on the left-hand wall, with the bookshelves between them and filling every other space except for a single door on the right-hand wall, which was closed. We all filed in and took our places at the table, which had on its surface upwards of thirty candles clustered at the centre. As we sat down, I couldn't help but notice how warm this room was. I wondered if it was the heat of those flickering candle flames before me. Three bronze incense burners were also placed on that table, their coals already lit. I took the pouch that Burroughs had given me and filled each incense burner in turn. Clouds of smoke rose instantly from them, quickly filling the room with a haze of woody, quite pleasant scent. 
Burroughs had also given me a few lines to deliver. He had told me that the group would then know what to do, and that I should just follow their lead. We joined hands, and I read out the carefully handwritten instructions. Larim A and Marvasa, I said loud and clear. I didn't know what it meant, or what tongue I was speaking in. I then followed with, We summon, stir, and call upon the denizens of this place. You who are dead, you who are restless, spirits of water, of wood and stone, spirits once of flesh and blood and bone, Keepers of secrets, guardians of the gate, we call to you in this hour so late. The group then all took up the same chant they had on the first night in the castle, an intoning that I immediately followed and I became aware that the owners of the house, along with their guests, were beginning to join us. I avoided looking at them directly, and the light from the candles was blinding me slightly, but I was still aware how smartly dressed they all were, as if this were some grand occasion. The men, all in tuxedos, the women dressed in bustle dress ball gowns. I smiled fleetingly at the dedication of our little audience to the theme. They certainly looked the part, and actually added to the unusual and distinct nature of the experience as the butler moved between them topping up their glasses. It was at that moment, a huge crashing sound came from upstairs, from the room directly above us. My companions immediately stopped their chanting, as did I a split second later, and a hushed anticipation fell over the room as if everyone were waiting for the sound to repeat itself, to confirm that we hadn't all imagined it. A woman's voice whispered, there's no one upstairs. It was that kind of proof that you want to hear, but at the same time you don't really believe. Then another enormous crashing sound came, even louder than the first, almost inhuman in its severity and strength. I cast my eyes to the faces of those seated around the table. I knew that someone would possibly be soon able to channel whatever it was. Then there was a thudding sound, like a footstep, heavy and deliberate. It almost seemed to contain malice and violence in the very sound of it. Despite the room being so filled, I still felt almost alone, as if those around me were no match for what approached, and that I should just break free and flee that place. I didn't. I waited as those thudding steps moved away from directly above our room, and then appeared to cross the landing before sounding as if someone were coming down the stairs, until as they came to the hallway, the sound then faded to nothing. A moment then hung in the air where we were all in suspension. We knew it approached, and all we could do was wait. And then I heard it, and the latch on the large white door that led into that room you could hear it moving slowly backward, and the door clicked open and swung wide. 
were revealing the corridor beyond, flickering candle flame, illuminating a somewhat hazy aura that seemed to hang in the air. Then the door slammed shut, and as it did, with such force, the draft it created nearly plunged us into darkness as the candles struggled to maintain their flame. Instantly the twins jumped to their feet and flailing and rasping let out some unimaginable, almost demonic tongue. They acted as one, each movement instantly mimicked in the other, like some terrible animated pair of marionettes. They then fell back into their seats and slumped forward. Who are you? I demanded. What is your name? The twins were rock still, their mouths wide, their eyes almost completely darkened. The room was suddenly as ice. I shivered. I didn't know if it was in terror or in chill. But either way, my lip trembled as I asked again, Who are you? What do you want? They turned to me in unison from their gaping, delicate mouths. A hissing voice from the abyss replied, <coughs> Their breath was as ice. It floated out across the table. We wish to know why you are troubled. What is it you want? I asked in as firm a tone as my nerves could muster. We want them dead, they replied with such hate that it almost felt as if their words were weapons that cut at my very being. The air in the room then suddenly darkened, as if the smoke from the incense were choking out the candlelight, its scent now grating in my throat. Why do you want them dead? I demanded. The twins then turned their heads to stare at the owners of the property and their guests, Ours. They rasped. Who are you? I asked again. We are the waters. We are the keepers. We are the blood and stone. We are the earth and bone. And you. They whispered. For a moment I was transfixed, as if the very place was speaking to me, as if the earth beneath me, the wood, and that dark lake were speaking. And the world as I knew it was slipping from my conscious grasp and for a second I feared I would be lost, that I would slip into a darkness from which I would never return. The candles were dimming, the light fading, a thick mist filled the room, and my breathing was short and laboured. Then those candles and our oil lamps went out. Our only illumination, then being the moonlight, still streaming in through the windows, I could only think to ask one thing. What would appease you? I stuttered from my trembling mouth. Their deaths!
as the answer screamed from the moors of the twins. This shark sent the room into turmoil. One of the female guests nearly fainted, and a scream went out from another as the men let out various words, loud words and grunts of reassurance from throats clearly choked with fear. I couldn't help the thought that fleetingly sprang into my mind at that instant that this was not quite the amusement our observers had imagined it would be, a formal dinner, some drinks, and then a ritual of sorts performed by some odd amusing people. But it turned out to be a vision of hell to their way of thinking. I don't know why I said it. It was the first thing that came to mind. We shall not let you, I shouted as I rose to my feet. We shall banish you. And the void eyes of those poor girls then shot back to me. You cannot banish us, they clacked in a tone like metal on metal. It is we who will banish you. As those words fell from them, a book flew across the room and struck me on the temple. The pain of the impact made me release my grip on the hand of Talia as I grabbed my forehead in a pointless defensive reflex. As I did, it was as if an energy shimmered around us, terrible, fragile as glass. A scream, two mouths in perfect harmony, shattered in that moment. The twins were released, their voices so piercing, so sharp. It seemed almost that they slashed at the fabric of my mind. I became aware at that instant that our audience were fleeing the spectacle, their nerves and sense of self-preservation having got the better of them. Someone flung open the door, seeking escape as the twins slumped forward, and their screams ebbing away as their senses returned. But that doorway did not offer the salvation that was sought. Instead, what gripped us all was the thick black pall of smoke that streamed in, hanging high in the air above us. As we looked out into the corridor, there was nothing but red glowing embers, where those candles and drapes and fine curtains had been. Someone rose to my left and rushed to the other door and tried the handle. I think it was Peter, but in the confusion and wailing of voices I couldn't be sure. It's locked, they shouted in a voice filled with panic. Our circle had by now all sprung to their feet. The owners of the house and some of their guests were moving into the passage. I shouted that we should go out of the windows, but it was the butler, I think, who shouted back to me. They're all locked, too, he bellowed, and all the keys are in the kitchen. There was a moment of hesitation, as if everyone still in the room couldn't decide what to do. I shouted, let's smash them then, but a male voice shouted back that they're too tough and that we haven't the time, and with that everyone started to follow those in the corridor, rushing forward, ducking down beneath the increasing fumes as they headed toward the main door. How can they be too tough, I thought, as I stared at them all. I was frozen by the thought that those embers could pick up at any moment, that this was a fire starved of oxygen that I was looking at, and that the whole thing might go up when they opened the door. I was by now gasping for breath, my head spinning as I tried to stay low. I rushed to the window, pulled up on the sash, but quickly saw that some special kind of lock was indeed holding it fast. My eyes frantically scanned the room. 
I needed a heavy object, something that I could smash the small Georgian frames with. I then saw it, barely visible, a thick wooden plant stand near the other door. I ran over and knocked the aspidestra perched on top of it onto the floor, and hauling it onto my shoulder I ran back to the window, bringing it down almost immediately into the wooden frame. The owner was right. It was tough. Too tough, for one blow at least. The glass had smashed, but I hadn't even broken one strut. I repeated my assault. This time with all the force my air-starved body could muster. Splitting two struts in the process, but I was barely through. I kicked out at it futilely. It was way tougher than I could ever have imagined. A perfect example of good workmanship, I mused. That was now also a prison bar of wood. I knew I had to break it. I could hear the voice of the owner shouting that they couldn't get the door open. Maybe the heat had swelled it, I thought, in my crazed mind, crazed with dread fear. I raised that plant stand above my head, my body weakening as smoke streamed past me, filling my lungs. But somehow, with that next blow, I found just enough strength, just enough force to shatter that frame, to shatter it enough that I could get through it. I shouted to the others as I climbed through. I've broken the window. Come back. But then I slipped, glass slicing my hand, and I was tumbling forward onto the cold earth of the flower bed beneath that window. I immediately rose and stared through the smoke, hoping to see the others coming towards me, and I could just make out figures, shapes in that dark, swirling smoke before me. Then Talia's face appeared, Peter, Mason, and then, and then, then it was as if I were consumed in flame. It hit me with such force that for a second I thought I must be dead. I felt myself flying through the air, heat searing my flesh, and then cold, wet grass against my face, and screams. For a second I dared not move, I dared not move, for myself, and for them. I didn't want to know, but those screams, those terrible screams, made me. I raised my head. I was facing away from the house, but turned to behold a sight I could never have imagined. For there in the window, framed like some living work of horror, was the form of Talia, half hanging out, her entire being aflame and arriving in a futile attempt to be free. An inferno behind her, streaming past her, seeking the dark of the night as it incinerated her flesh. And there, in a raging, fiery tempest behind her. I could see little figures dancing, living wicks of human flesh and fat, swaying in a hopeless dance of death. I leapt to my feet and ran forward, screaming, No, no, no! As I did, in my mind, I wanted to save her. But the heat, the terrible heat, pushed me back. 
I could no more have saved her than I could have made it rain to extinguish that nightmare. I could only stand raging and then transfixed in horror, watching helplessly as they were consumed. I fell to my knees, pressed my face against the cold earth beneath me. My seared skin soothed a little by it. As I ran my hand across it, I had no eyebrows. It was a petty and meaningless injury, and I couldn't believe that for a fleeting second I was concerned with how that might look. And then it struck me. Maybe some of the others had escaped. Maybe they'd opened the door. Maybe they were burned and needed help. I leapt to my feet. My legs were like jelly. And for a second, they resisted. They resisted my will to run or even to move to action. And when they did, they were disjointed and jagged in movement. I ran around the house to find the door we had entered through. But when I saw it, I knew. It was closed, burning on the top half, smoldering on the bottom. The windows either side burst, fire belching through those perfect, intact Georgian sash frames. There was no one there. No bodies, no burned victims, no one. I let out another rage-filled cry. I was beyond hope, beyond reason. Frantic to act, but there was no act I could take to change any of it. And then my mind was filled with one thought alone, that I had to get help. Maybe someone managed to get out of another window, I thought. And so I ran, ran toward the lake. Those oil lamps still guiding my chaotic, stumbling strides. My only thought was to get back to my car, to get to my phone and call for help. I came to the lake's edge, tripped and fell face forward into the water and mud beneath me. I desperately scanned the shore for the boats. For a second I couldn't see them, but then I glimpsed just one, barely visible in the pale moonlight. As I struggled through the murky, shallow waters towards it, and it was then I realized someone was sat in it. I rushed toward them, hauled myself onto the craft. The huddled, robed figure at the bow of the boat was smoldering, and turned away from me, as if they were oblivious to my arrival. I could barely speak my throat, so choked by fumes. Thank God, I said desperately. Are there any others? Did anyone else get out? They all burned, came the reply, their voice no more than a hollow whisper. My hands grasped the sides of my head. I knew what they were saying was almost certainly true, but I couldn't let it overwhelm me. I had to reject it and to believe it wasn't. I had to believe there were others, but at least there was one, I thought as I threw myself down on the hard wooden seat and grabbed the oars. We have to get help, I half shouted as I began to frantically row. I could still see the house burning furiously, the roof now ablaze the flames tearing at the night sky.
and within that raging tumult of fire I could still see shapes like human figures writhing, their hands reaching to me as if pleading for my return. And when I closed my eyes to shut out that torturous scene, those images remained, playing out on the inside of my eyelids like some self-made horror movie. I dug those oars in deep, pulling on them so hard that barely could we have travelled fifty yards and my hands burned with blisters yet to break forth. What is the point when they're all dead? Came a barely audible whisper from over my shoulder. I stopped rowing. If they were all dead, I knew I had to know. I had to know who it was. The voice was neutral. A whisper that could be a man or a woman. Maybe it was one of the twins. Maybe what I saw was wrong, maybe Talia, maybe she had escaped after all, but then my eyes fell upon nothing, nothing but the empty bow illuminated, illuminated clearly in the glow of the radiant full moon that now sat alone in a cloudless sky. I dropped the oars and in a blind panic I scanned the waters around me. Had they jumped overboard? Had they taken their own life in desolation? I wondered. And I knew why, why they might have slipped silently into that abyss of darkness beneath us. Guilt, a guilt that was welling within me, I had smashed the window. I fed that stagnant fire with what it needed most to burn. To burn all those still within that monstrosity of a house. Maybe they too had broken a window to escape. Maybe they too had saved themselves. Knowing, just as I did, what might come of it. And only those cold waters could absolve them. I stared, rock still, looking for any signs, any flicker of life on that mercurial surface. The boat stilled. There was nothing, no movement, no sound, save for the baying of a single fox far away and the lightest ripple of water against wood. And no sound of fire either. That realization made me lift my head and to gaze back to the far shore. There were no flames to be seen, no lanterns, nothing but dark, choking woods and a thin mist hanging over that silvery mirror of a lake that surrounded me. In that nightmare of stillness, I thought to join whoever it was in those depths. But I couldn't. Not until I knew, for certain. There could still be someone, someone who needed me to get to that phone. A feeble excuse, but that was just enough for me to grab those oars once more and row. The craft felt lighter, and soon it was crashing up onto the reed beds. I threw myself over the side, knee-deep in water. I stumbled and fell until I was up into the twisted branches of that gnarled forest, branches that almost seemed to grab at me as I ducked and weaved and made my way into their maze-like mass of darkness. So many times I fell in there, so many times I was sure I heard whispers 
the cracking of branches behind me. I would turn and dread terror, shapes, shadows, shifting in my vision, my heart pounding, fear threatening to overwhelm me. And then I was out, free, into the fields, step after step I stumbled, my hands and legs torn. And then I was near the road, I jumped over a low hedge, falling hard onto the tarmac that lay beyond, and then I ran, ran to the salvation of my car. A metal shell in which sanity and safety resided. I threw open the door, grabbed my phone. Where was Burroughs, I thought. Should I call him first? No, I can't. Emergency services first, then Burroughs. Which service do you require? The operator said. There's been a fire, a terrible fire, I shouted. She put me through to the fire department, where I was then asked where I was, where the fire was and who I was. I could only tell her the coordinates Burroughs had given me and vague directions based on where I thought I had been. But at this point, the conversation took an odd turn. The operator asked me, if this was concerning a fire at a house by a lake, and when I said it was, she asked me if I rode to it with a small party of friends. I confirmed that I did, and she then told me that I should wait where I was, and someone would be sent out to me, then ending the call abruptly. As I sat trying to make sense of what I'd just heard, I noticed a note pinned under the wiper blade. I opened the door and grabbed it, expecting it to be from Burroughs to say where he had gone. But there, written in bold ink, were the words, Do not call the emergency services. Call me as soon as you get home. Regards, Charles. I had that sinking feeling at that moment, that whatever the truth was of the events of this night, it was not what I imagined it to be, and it began to slowly dawn on me that this might well be one of Burroughs' games, only a game that had gone terribly wrong. I thought to drive away, but I'd given them my name, which meant they could find me, and I'd look guilty as hell if I now ran. As I sat there contemplating my options and the myriad of ways I could be fitted up for arson, I became aware of a blue flashing light in the distant darkness, a light that drew closer and closer, a sense of judicial dread travelling in step, with it. And somewhere deep in my mind, I knew the horrors of this night were far from being done. <laughs>